Hello, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait until uh, the participants populate. Uh, the numbers are skyrocketing. Um, we're very happy to have you on the uh, future of the wedding industry in New South Wales webinar brought to you by uh, Restaurant and Catering in Wedded Wonderland. Um, wow, the numbers are, are shooting well over 100. Whoa, they're just skyrocketing. So um, we will wait till all the participants uh, uh, get into the room. And uh, we're also waiting on the minister. And so we won't uh, kick off until the minister arrives. And um, we definitely see some hellos and uh, thank yous in the, uh, in the um, <coughs> chat function. So hello to everyone. Uh, and no, not, minister's not here yet, but I'm sure he will be here soon. Thank you for all the uh, beautiful comments. Um, there we go. All right, so, and we have the minister. So uh, welcome everyone to the future of the wedding industry in New South Wales webinar. Uh, I am Wes Lambert, the CEO of Restaurant and Catering. Uh, we have uh, as a special guest joining us, the Honorable Stuart Ayres uh, MP, the New South Wales Minister for Tourism. Uh, Wendy L. Corey, the director and founder of Wedded Wonderland. And Tom Green, the head of Policy, Government, and Public Affairs of Restaurant and Catering. So I'm going to uh, just kick off the meeting uh, by um, welcoming everyone and thanking you again for joining us uh, and to let you know who Restaurant and Catering is. Uh, Restaurant and Catering uh, is the industry peak body that represents the restaurant, cafe, and catering segment of the accommodation food service industry uh, around the country and specifically in New South Wales. Uh, in New South Wales, there are 1,485 caterers, uh, including those in function centers uh, and event centers. So it's quite a large cohort of businesses and certainly one uh, that will need um, special care uh, as we exit this lockdown. Um, if you're wondering why many of you are here today, it is to get caught up uh, with the minister and with Wendy and Tom and myself uh, to what is going on in the uh, wedding industry specifically uh, and how we expect and how we will continue to um, liaise with the government on uh, the fastest and best and safest way for the wedding industry to reopen in New South Wales uh, and certainly we'll be relying upon the minister uh, to um, uh, give his presentation and also uh, to answer uh, any questions that may uh, pop up. And uh, Tom will be um, moderating the questions today and answering uh, any restaurant and catering specific queries. Uh, Wendy will certainly be um, uh, speaking on behalf of the tens of thousands of brides and grooms and families uh, and the industry and suppliers and, and the entire supply chain uh, of the wedding industry. Uh, and um, we absolutely hope that uh, we are able to uh, answer as many of your questions as possible. And uh, before I hand over to the minister, I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that uh, uh, Minister Brad Hazard uh, has signed the wedding public health order uh, that goes into effect on the 3rd of September uh, for uh, weddings uh, to be uh, available to up to 11 people, as Wendy has, has rightly explained, uh, including all of those that are allowed to be there, uh, and you to open as a, a essential service to do that, uh, but obviously not the receptions. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Minister Stuart Ayers. Thanks, Wes. Uh, first and foremost, can I just say thank you to everyone for your uh, resilience over the last few months, but in reality, over the last 18 months, it's been a challenging period of time for everyone across the community. Um, governments are trying to get settings right. Businesses are trying to function as best they can. Um, the dynamic and changing nature of COVID over those last 18 months has tested all of us. Um, but I think your sector um, in, particularly has, uh, in particular has been challenged immensely um, and is and is definitely in a particular situation right now that is no doubt uh, extremely difficult. Um, there is a little bit of light on the horizon, I think it's fair to say. Um, the announcements by uh, Minister Hazard 
um, with relation to allowing weddings to resume from a legal perspective um, with small numbers, I think is a has been a good decision. It was a it was I think what you might describe as a kind of pre uh, Delta anomaly um, as we came into Delta um, and were going pretty hard and fast at, at taking things out. Um, as that evolved over a period of time, we we recognised that we should be able to get weddings back going. Um, from a, at least from a legal perspective um, and where you can manage those with relation to the public health orders. Um, the second thing I would say, um, which I think is probably um, much more pertinent, is that uh, it's not a dark tunnel we're in anymore. There is a strong light um, at the end of this tunnel. Um, I feel very confident about seeing it. In fact, I'm running pretty hard at it every single day. Um, the vaccination rates are the driving force of this as vaccination rates increase rapidly in New South Wales and across the country. Um, we've all heard the words Doherty report a zillion times, but the principles are very solid. Um, and New South Wales is working um, in line with what Doherty is asking um, of um, the state governments. And to that end, uh, our increasing rates of vaccination mean that we're on track to um, be around fully vaccinated uh, status for 70% of our adult population um, in the middle of October. Um, so we're working uh, towards that. The government has said uh, that it will release a roadmap around what the restrictions will be uh, for that um, post 70% operating environment. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, that we're at the pointy end of those discussions inside government. Uh, you would have heard um, through a number of different media outlets, um, the regular press conferences hosted by the by the Premier. But I think a really important point to note here is that 70% represents opportunities for people that have been fully vaccinated. Um, so I think it's a reasonable assumption at this stage to say um, that hospitality um, activities, including uh, weddings and wedding receptions, um, will have a lot more opportunity to take place with larger numbers um, where all participants are fully vaccinated. Um, and that's a fundamental principle of uh, what will be the roadmap that the government releases, um, particularly around this 70%. Um, there's a little bit more work uh, to do between 70 and 80%. Um, if you look around the globe, there is uh, not many countries that have actually gone to 80% double dose vaccination, um, Malta. Um, uh, Singapore is putting pretty close to that. Um, Israel's not far off. Um, in fact, some some charts I see have Israel just tipping over that figure, um, but most of them have them in, in high 70s. So it, it is still a challenge to get populations to go from 70 to 80% fully vaccinated. The other challenge that we have here in Australia is, um, is we have lots of uh, vaccine supply. Um, there is uh, huge amounts of vaccine supply. Um, it's just in a vaccine that not everyone feels comfortable in taking. Um, so there is a little bit of brand damage, um, completely unwarranted and unfounded brand damage, which I'd be pretty clear about. AstraZeneca is one of the most effective vaccines in human history um, in protecting um, people right around the globe. Um, so there, there is a stronger demand for Pfizer. And whilst um, the Commonwealth is doing I think a very admirable job at trying to procure additional Pfizer doses ahead of their existing orders that will be coming in in larger volumes in the back end of the year. Um, we've been able to secure additional doses, which has helped particularly New South Wales um, lift its vaccination rates. Um, so as people get uh, double dosed um, and the, the supply of uh, Pfizer whether we like this or not is having an impact on the speed at which people are choosing to get vaccinated. Um, that's uh, that's going to be one of those challenges that we have to overcome. Um, but one thing I would say, um, as the concept of um, fully vaccinated participants becomes a reality, um, you should definitely be encouraging people to consider options um, around getting vaccinated with whatever vaccine that is available to them um, in their local communities. And I can say with absolute confidence that if you wanted to get vaccinated in New South Wales, uh, within a couple of days, you, you could do that. Um, uh, that. That availability exists either through the booking system, directly through a New South Wales health clinic, um, or um, through one of our walk-in clinics or through a pharmacy or a GP. So I think, Wes, that's the kind of macro setting. Um, I'm happy to drill down a little bit more into 
some of the more nuanced questions. Um, obviously, um, we haven't publicly released um, our roadmap yet. So some of those, um, I suspect there'll be some questions that'll be answered with that, but I'll be able to at least steer and guide most of the people on the call uh, around what the intentions of the government are and that will at least help some businesses um, start their early preparatory work for reopening. Thanks, Minister, for your um, willingness to uh, answer the questions in the Q&A section, uh, which Tom will, um, will mediate. Uh, so many of you uh, have called, emailed, uh, tweeted, text, uh, every possible communication method asking what restaurant and catering is doing uh, for the catering uh, segment, for the wedding segment, for the function event, event segment. And um, the, as the minister will tell you, restaurant and catering has made its submission uh, to the government in relation to what we'd like to see on the roadmap. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a brief uh, update of what that is. For function and events, uh, we certainly would like to see uh, not so restrictive uh, per square meter rules, uh, one per two outside and uh, at a minimum one per four inside. Uh, certainly, I uh, would like to see better than that um, as soon as possible. Um, the mask mandate uh, in the beginning, uh, but very quickly moving to a non-mask scenario. Um, we support the check-in, the QR code check-in uh, function that we know the New South Wales government is going to introduce. Uh, we absolutely understand that uh, dancing must be allowed uh, at a wedding. Um, certainly the size of the cohort that's allowed to dance uh, is flexible, but we, we absolutely uh, side with you that there has to be some dancing. Uh, and then alcohol for seated patrons. Uh, and you know, as the minister said, uh, and as the premier says every single day, uh, that at 70%, we fully expect that this will be only for fully vaccinated uh, patrons and staff. And so it is very important um, that uh, you are encouraging uh, everyone that you know, uh, your clients, your suppliers, your, your uh, customers uh, and your staff to get that vaccination, whatever vaccination is available. Uh, and uh, if you are not a member, if you're on this uh, uh, webinar and you are not a member of Restaurant and Catering and you want your voice to be heard, you want to be able to text, tweet, call, email us uh, so that uh, your voice is heard uh, when we uh, reach out and liaise with government, uh, you can go to www.rca.asn.au or call 1300 722 uh, It is very important that we have. Um, uh, as many voices as possible so that we can get a balanced uh, view to uh, ministers uh, like um, Minister Ayres. Uh, and also um, we have called for um, uh, reopening grant funding uh, and outdoor activation grant funding. As we know, many uh, of you operate primarily indoors and, and certainly uh, the business support grants and job saver may be just keeping you afloat at the moment and you need that extra kick uh, before you reopen. Uh, and like many uh, other jurisdictions, and certainly in line with what both the Premier and the Prime Minister have said, uh, at 80%, we absolutely want to see uh, a return to almost uh, pre-COVID levels, uh, and, you know, at, at a best case scenario, uh, but at least uh, the pre-lockdown levels. And we will continue to work with the government and be the voice of uh, the industry uh, to ensure that uh, we get the best possible outcome in the roadmap. And so now over to Wendy to talk about how all of this is affecting uh, couples and, and uh, the supply chain. We have a scenario. Uh, thank you so much, firstly, um, to Minister Stewart Ayres and uh, to Restaurant Caring for hosting um, this very, very important discussion. Uh, the scenario that's playing out in the wedding industry at the moment is there are quite a number of couples who have had to postpone their weddings now for the third or fourth time and are really wanting uh, to proceed with their weddings in uh, November, December, January moving forward and are wanting to understand what the restrictions are around that. In the lead up to planning a wedding, there are a number of factors that need to be considered, including being able to visit your um, dress designer, uh, being able to fit for a suit, um, a, a lot of these, uh, um, uh, I guess, conversations and, and, and meetings are taking place via Zoom. But there are there are some scenarios where people do actually need to be able to access um, these retail components within the wedding market. Along with that, we have the industry, which 
um, has now uh, moved the target, uh, you know, three or four times for their couple. And the value within uh, at any given wedding, there are on average 22 suppliers at work on any given wedding. When you move that once, twice, three times, you cannot align. It, it's become quite difficult to be able to align all of the suppliers that are attached to that wedding. Deposits have been paid, payments have been made. And so this, this constant um, uh, you know, moving of that target has made it very difficult to future plan and future proof uh, the wedding industry and, and allow the couples to be able to look forward to planning their big day. So really what we need to understand is where are we, um, uh, where are weddings going to be in October, November, December? Um, in, in regards to uh, the vaccine, which is, is a very big question in relation to guests, in relation to staff, external contractors that come into a venue, um, into a ceremony, how is this going to be managed? Um, and, uh, and what can the industry be doing right now to ensure that they are uh, prepared for what's to come in relation to weddings moving forward? So that's, that's essentially where we're at. Well, Wendy, that, that is a, a lot of key issues and certainly uh, many things, many questions that need to be answered uh, from the entire uh, pipeline uh, that brings a wedding uh, from you know, the, the ring to the, uh, the I do. Uh, so uh, we've reached now the uh, Q&A portion of the webinar uh, and Tom Green, our head of policy, uh, has already received some amazing uh, and very important questions uh, that he's now going to um, uh, ask of, uh, uh, of all of us. Uh, I'm sure that many of them will be answered by the minister, but uh, certainly uh, when needed, uh, uh, Wendy and myself will uh, jump in and, and answer. Thank you, Wes, and, and thank you, Wendy, and, and to Mr. Ayers for joining us. I think this is a really useful and important discussion. Um, I, I'm on the phone with members all across New South Wales that are um, you know, trying to manage their suppliers, manage their couples um, and, and manage their businesses as well. So being able to give them a little bit of, um, an, of an understanding of what the next three months is going to look like, I think is going to be very important. Um, the first question is actually um, to you, Minister, if I can, which is, you know, we've seen, um, you know, 70 to 80% of the two target figures that everyone's talking about, they're our kind of golden tickets to freedom. Um, when, when a roadmap is released in New South Wales, do you think there will actually be a, like a single document that, we'll, that people will be able to go to and have a look at, you know, when we get to 70%, which may or may not be in middle October, it's going to look like this. And in 80%, it's going to look like this. Um, do, do we expect there to be kind of a, a single source of truth for, for what those big threshold restrictions are going to bring? Uh, yeah, Tom, I do. I do think that will be the case. I think you'll see a, a, a document, a roadmap that will be published definitely in the macros around um, at 70%. This is what we believe are the operating conditions across the economy. Um, in fact, it's so that that I think um, will will take place. It'll give you a pretty clear understanding of how things can function. Um, sitting below that will be a lot more detailed information um, that will sit for specific industries. And just looking at the chat that's going on um, whilst this um, seminar is taking place, there are some quite specific things that will relate to this sector. Um, now, some of those things will be captured by macros, but we'll want to be able to provide more um, detailed, nuanced questions. And I think they'll, that, that form of communication will come in, in two forms. One, a higher level uh, macro settings. These are the things you can do um, at 70% under these conditions, i.e. being fully vaccinated. Um, and then the stepping up into 80%, how that changes the, the operating environment for the entire economy. Um, and then sitting below that will be the opportunity for um, government to provide more d detailed information um, to operators around how to conduct their activities. Now, that information won't sit in isolation. It'll be um, it'll it'll be what you might describe as kind of easy to consume versions of what is in, in a public health order. And so to give you an example, and it's a question I've seen pop up on the chat a few times, we talk about fully vaccinated status and people say, you know, can we legally stop someone from coming somewhere? Well, the government has the ability to create that legal environment through a public health order. And you should expect that um, through that public health order, um, fully vaccinated people will be able to do certain things permitted under the public health order. Um, that is a 
a, a le- very sound, strong legal um, position. It's a public health orders are effectively uh, laws that override other laws. Um, they've been well endorsed and well supported by the courts in Australia um, during um, the last 18 months. Um, the courts recognise that these public health orders are in place um, to uh, overwhelmingly protect um, the public from what is a clearly identifiable risk, and so they have a strong legal standing. Um, they have a strong legal standing for um, uh, for being in place. Hmm. And, and and I think there's a there's a very kind of interesting segue for that, um, Wendy. And this might be a question for you in in terms of your your um, kind of interaction with different suppliers, and then then also to you, Minister. Um, Weddings are a very, very unique beast in that you have lots and lots of different puzzle pieces that are all extremely vital in bringing the whole event together, whether it's the florist or the cake maker or the DJ or the band or whoever it is, um, you know, in, in other business environments, if you have someone or a staff member that isn't vaccinated, when we get to 70%, you can kind of manage, but you can't exactly hold a wedding without a florist or without a cake maker. Um, Wendy, what do you think is going to be the challenges that it's going to that, it, that is going to exist at that initial seventy percent figure, and how widespread do you think those challenges will be? Eighty-five percent of the wedding industry is small business. Over fifty percent is sole trader. So when you are booking in the service providers, you are booking in that particular um, talent, whether it be the florist, um, the hairdresser, the makeup artist, etc., for your day. So the the variables are the date of the wedding. And of course, the fact that generally speaking within these businesses, there's one, three, maybe five people that can facilitate that requirement. And so it does put a huge um, you know, question um, to businesses in relation to um, that target that is being uh, you know, uh, requested across the board. And I think this is something that you know, within the wedding sector, uh, a lot of these businesses also work within private events. It's not just weddings, it's across um, some of them are retailers, so they do have face-to-face and, you know, bricks and mortar trade, as well as um, uh, the private event uh, market. So there are a, a number of pillars within each of these businesses. And I think we need to look at the wedding industry um, within its nuances, but also in the broader spectrum that this is, you know, a public health order and that, you know, we hope that these business owners um, will be able to service these couples. Absolutely. And I think it, it kind of goes back to the minister's earlier point, which is there is lots of vaccine available and you sh- we should be getting the vaccine. I know personally, um, I, I went and got myself AstraZeneca because that was the vaccine that was available to me. And I'm soon to get my second jab and come kind of middle of October, I'm going to be fully vaccinated and I'm looking forward to going out to a restaurant and, and doing all the things that I normally did. Um, where's one of the follow ups for a lot of businesses here is how are they going to be checking that people are vaccinated. You know, what's going to be the process for them to do that? I know that that you and, and 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 RCA have been involved in some discussions with the New South Wales government about how they're going to do this. What exactly is it going to look like at seventy percent when we've got to start checking people's vaccination status? Uh, so I'm sure the minister will correct. Do you me. want me to answer that, Tom, or is that to Wes? <laughs> I was going to send it to Wes and then also to the minister yeah. as well. Yeah, I know, I know that, if, 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 if you want to give, uh, I'm trying to share the questions around. I'm trying to be even. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Go ahead. No, no, so look, I think uh, to, there's a couple of things that are taking place. The, the Commonwealth Government is the keeper of immunisation records in Australia. So when you are vaccinated, whether it's with a COVID vaccine or other forms of vaccine, your immunisation record is kept um, by the Commonwealth. Um, what many people who are on this call and Australians right around the country who are being vaccinated, um, they're able to, through their MyGov um, account, um, download a digital certificate that sits in their in their um, digital wallet um, on their on their smartphone. They can also have a record of their vaccination um, sent to them um, as an email. That's the first uh, principle of where we are set at the moment. What we're endeavouring to get to though is a um, integration here in New South Wales. Um, with the Service New South Wales app that would allow for QR code check-ins and vaccination status to be established um, at the point of entry. And if that can be done digitally, um, that uh, creates a much better customer interface um, for participants and it's a much easier environment for businesses to be able to function. So that's the objective that we're looking to get to. 
We don't want that to necessarily be an inhibitor to opening up. So we do recognise that there'll be some transition um, period of time where the digital certificate that sits in your wallet that will be visually cited will play a role. Um, but ultimately, we would like to get to a position where your vaccination status is on your Service New South Wales app. And when you use QR code to check into a venue or location, your vaccination status will come up green and you'll be allowed entry. And, and, and I think, you know, we've all gotten used to those QR codes, so it'll just be as seamless as we as we have been through the whole process, I think. Um, an, an interesting follow-up for you, Minister, and obviously given your community in Penrith is kind of part of these, or were for a period of time, part of these LGAs or suburbs of concern, we've got a lot of still existing... Is. Still is, and we've got a lot of existing rules at the moment, whether they be LGAs of concern and being unable to leave those LGAs, whether it's Greater Sydney residents not being able to visit regional New South Wales. When we hit that 70% figure and that 80% figure, is there an expectation that a lot of those rules will become quite different and that freedom of movement will allow people in, say, you know, the Penrith LGA to come into the city for a wedding or even to go um, further west into regional New South Wales to go to a wedding as well? Do we expect those rules to change? Yeah, so what, Tom, I think the first point I would say here is that before you even get to LGAs of concern, the overriding public health order position is the stay at home order. So all New South Wales citizens are asked to stay at home unless they're conducting what is substantively for activities. Um, hospitality, weddings, show, social events are not included in that. So the most important thing that's required is the removal of the stay at home order that will allow mobility across the economy and, and events like weddings to take place again. It will then be about what levels of restrictions um, that take out portions of the population. So we've discussed quite openly the idea of being um, double vaccinated. I can't <laughs> see a scenario where a double vaccinated person from an LGA of concern is prevented from going somewhere when a double vaccinated person from a non-LGA of concern could, could attend. So that's a good example of where uh, the overriding arrangements around stay-at-home stay orders take precedence. And then our roadmap arrangements will be saying what's permissible at 70% versus what's permissible at 80% and beyond. To, to take that question and make it a little bit more national then, um, in an environment where New South Wales looks like it's going to beat all the other states and get to 70% before everyone else and it's going to be markedly open, um, how do you expect the New South Wales government to treat interstate arrivals that might be coming into New South Wales for for any range of, of reasons, um, but they'd be free to do so. Do you think we're going to start allowing interstate travellers to come into New South Wales, whether they can get back to their state of concern is another question, but how do you think those interstate arrivals will be treated if they're coming for a wedding or something? Well, Tom, I th I, the Premier today and in the last few days has been talking about openly about the prospect of being able to allow more Australians to return home from overseas and more international engagement. Um, I think if we're, if we're talking about that, then New South Wales is going to take a pretty proactive position around allowing people to visit to visit our state. Um, hopefully that's for um, weddings of, uh, in venues that are represented on this call. Um, what I can't guarantee is uh, the mindset of premiers in other states um, that would allow those people to, to travel back home. But I think it's fair to say that the predisposition of the New South Wales government is to be as open as possible, as quickly as possible, as safe as possible. Um, and to, to that end, I, I can easily foreshadow the type of environment where New South Wales is um, allowing people in, um, but whether people respond to that because they can't get back to their home state will largely be a, a challenge nationally. And I think we've seen um, the Premier today, a number of you know, state ministers have been saying stick to the plan. I've seen the Prime Minister and the Federal Treasurer say stick to the plan. Um, that's largely because we want Australia to move in unison. Um, and uh, and that's definitely our objective. We, we would like all states to move um, in line with, with Doherty, um, in line with 70 and 80%. Um, but if that's not the case, then we don't want to prohibit unnecessarily activity in New South Wales. Absolutely. And um, I think... It kind of going further into the future and looking at kind of maybe what an 80% figure looks like as much as we're all stuck on this first figure of 70. Um, do you think that the double vaccinated rule will remain at 80% or do you think that that that, that 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 double vaccination rule is really just for that 70% buffer to kind of take us through to 80%? So well, Tom, at the risk of... RCA. 
at the risk of sounding like a politician, uh, which I try to avoid on a regular basis, um, I, I really do think it will depend on what happens between or after 70%. In many respects, getting to 70% allows us to test systems. It allows us um, to test the um, veracity of our check-in, the ability to identify double vaccinated, what impact does that have on the way our community functions. So I think before I could give you a commitment about whether the double vaccinated requirement would change at 80%, I think we really do want to see how the community functions um, between 70 and 80%. And I have absolutely no doubt that we will learn things in that period of time that we'll be looking to implement into the future. If there's one thing that I've learned um, over the last 18 months in dealing with COVID is that you, you very rarely ever go into a situation where you know everything and you have everything covered. Um, you do the implementation the best you can. You engage and consult with industry. You try to make it as, as practical for business as possible. Um, but the lived experience will always refine um, will always refine your, your forward agenda and your forward program. And I think we're all quite desperate to, to kind of live the 70% plus experience and what that will mean for us going forward. And, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, my next question is actually perfectly covered off um, in the chat. And I'm glad that, 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 that both Mia and, and Kay have raised it, which really comes down to rapid antigen testing. Now, rapid antigen testing is something that, that we at RCA feel has a real um, strong utility, um, especially at ticketed events, which weddings really are. You can't really get in unless you're invited to go. Um, and I know it's something that Wendy and, and her team at Wended Wonderland have been really focused on. Do you think there's a utility in the future at some point to really look at rapid antigen testing in the kind of wedding or the ticketed event space as a way to kind of further unlock capacity in a lot of these events? Yeah, Tom, the first thing I would say is that we shouldn't think of rapid antigen testing as an alternative to vaccination. So I think a lot of people consider the idea of, I don't want to get vaccinated or some of my friends don't want to get vaccinated. So I'll I'll look to implement rapid antigen testing as the alternative. Um, so I think it's important that we dispel that as, a, as an alternative. We want as many people in Australia to be vaccinated. We have a long history of accepting vaccines as a nation. We're, we're generally um, a world leader um, in the ability to eradicate disease and viruses because of our high vaccination rates. So I think that's the first point. The second point I would say is that I do think over time there will be a role for rapid antigen testing, and I think that um, the TG, the Therapeutic Goods Association, sorry, the Therapeutic Goods Association, um, and other um, medical oversight bodies will need to adapt operating models um, to what I think will be a strong demand for the public for rapid antigen testing, and I see this as something that sits alongside a highly vaccinated um, community, not one that's in lieu of a highly vaccinated community. Um, it's becoming very clear that there's going to be a need for ongoing booster shots. Um, I think a lot of people will look for a second uh, layer of support and defence or information um, and rapid antigen tests do look like they'll play a role in that. I think that's one of the reasons why um, why Wes and yourself and the entire restaurant and catering uh, association has been strong proponents of them. Um, I do think they'll have a role to play, but I just think it will be in in addition to vaccinations, not in lieu of them. Absolutely. Um, so coming down to my final question, is actually Minister something that you touched on um, earlier, which is um, in our experience of going through different COVID safety plans and public health order iterations over the last 18 months, what we found is in particular for these uh, for the events industry and for weddings in particular, um, a lot of the, the issues that aren't captured by the macros, to use your terms, can really be the, the kind of the thing that decides whether or not an event goes ahead or doesn't. Now, that could be whether or not you're allowed to stand up and drink, which is the, the kind of yep. cocktail party arrangement. It's dancing. It's how many people are on the dance floor. It could be a, a range of different um, kind of smaller issues. Um, I, I know that you've said that that you're really keen to kind of take a lot of that feedback and, and we're going to be making sure that your team gets access to all the points that are being raised here. Um, but, but how open do you think the New South Wales government really is to, you know, whether it's in the COVID safety plan or in some other document, addressing some of those smaller issues? Because um, it's certainly something that we've seen is just as important as the one per four square metre rule, the one per two square metre rule, um, when it comes to whether or not these events really go ahead. Yeah, so Tom, I, first and foremost, I'd actually put those as macro conditions. I think whether you can stand and consume alcohol or whether you can dance 
a fundamental um, impacts on human behaviour, um, and particularly in the broader hospitality um, and events industry. The whole purpose of these things existing is so that we can gather and interact and um, and relate to each other. And one one thing that we've all um, lost a little bit um, through the last eighteen months is that you know incredibly important human contact. And so I think one of the things we'll be looking to do is make sure that we set those conditions um, as clearly as possible in those macro levels, so everyone understands what behaviours are are acceptable from a from a managing of risk perspective when it comes to health. Um, so I think you'll see those types of things set out pretty clearly um, in, in that macro um, roadmap so that you understand what type of event you can host and when you can host it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic here, um, although I would caveat that by saying I, I'm, I'm one of the ministers that has been quite outspoken about trying to support business and um, and support the events sector. Um, so I still do have to get um, alignment with my colleagues and, and we do make collective decisions um, because we all bring different experiences together. But I'd, I'd love nothing more than to see people being able to, you know, stand in a cocktail setting um, at a wedding or, or see, you know, a, an entire dance uh, or entire wedding you know, being able to dance. We just have to make sure that when we allow that to happen, we're doing so at, at an appropriate time where, where at risks associated with health can be mitigated safely. Um, and look, actually, one of my final questions then um, is something that's been raised a few times in the chat, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of try to bring them all together and phrase them in, in, in a pointed way. Um, for a lot of weddings, um, you, you really do need a lot of lead time to get them off the ground. You know, this is not like a, have we got a Sunday night reservation at a restaurant? Um, when it comes to the release of the roadmap, I know that the Premier has bandied about kind of mid-October as a day that we might hit that 70%. But when it comes to the roadmap, do you think that's something that we're going to see in the next two weeks, in the next four weeks? To the extent that I can eke out an answer from you, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a go and, and try and get the best answer that I can in this situation. Um, when do you think that document might be released? So, Tom, I think the best way for me to answer this is that we are absolutely aware that lead times are critical and the idea that we could release a roadmap, you know, a week or a few days before there was a change in operating environment um, is, is, not, is not correct. Um, we're, we're absolutely trying to get our macro settings out as early as we possibly can um, when we've got strong confidence around those vaccination rates, um, when we've completed the assessments around that roadmap, we'll, we'll put that out. Um, but we're pretty keen to get that out weeks in advance of the um, of the of that target date around seventy percent vaccination. Um, so we're running at that as hard as we possibly can. And and I think you know that's certainly been my advice to a lot of venues as well, which is being able to look at vaccination rates gives you in government a lot more confidence than looking at case numbers, for example, which was the environment that led to the lessening of restrictions in in every other kind of time that we've ever dealt with this. Um, so look, I really do thank you for those comments, and I, I will um, actually answer one my answer one question myself that I've said in the chat quite a few times, and it's one that we deal with at RCA quite a bit. And I'll answer this before handing back to Wes and Wendy um, is really to to answer the question around um, cancellations and disputes and the like, which is an issue that we certainly hear a lot of at RCA, and it's something that gets gets tossed around quite a bit. And I can understand that there's a lot of frustration out there. Um, my first call would be. Um, that really does come down to your contract. And it is so important to be rereading your contract. But secondly, it's really important that you actually go and speak to the venue or go and speak to the supplier that you're dealing with. It is vitally important. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a commercial tenant and a landlord situation or a residential tenant and a landlord situation or a contract between two suppliers or between a customer and a wedding venue. The most important thing that you can do at the moment is sit down and have a conversation with them and try and work through these issues. Because in my experience, most venues are going to want to do everything they can to keep their customers happy. It's what they do for a living. And a lot of them are really stretched almost to breaking point at the moment trying to do that. Um, so my, my invitation to anyone out there who's um, got problems, got issues, reach out to your venue and do your best to come to an arrangement where you're agreeing. Because the last thing that we want to see is more disputes on top of the pain and suffering that we're all going through through lockdown. I've just seen a few comments like that, so I thought I'd cover it off. Minister, thank you so much for answering some of those quick fire questions. Um, and now in the interest of time, I, I might hand back to Wes and, and Wendy just to wrap us up. Yeah. Tom, just before you do go back to Wes, I've seen one issue pop up a couple of times around uh, private catering or catering in the home. Um, 
this is an issue that we're aware of. We're going to um, um, we are looking to make sure that when we do release our roadmap, we we acknowledge that and provide an operating environment around how that can take place. Um, and so that's uh, that's definitely something we're we're aware of. We know it's a different operating environment to uh, a fixed venue. Um, but it is definitely something that's being um, discussed and considered uh, in the roadmap. Thank you, Minister. So, Wendy, I'll uh, hand over to you to uh, uh, give your closing comments and then I will wrap up the webinar. Thank you so much, Minister, and uh, to all of the comments and, uh, and information that has been provided. I just want to stress the importance of that roadmap. We are at the moment um, advising our couples a four to six week window in terms of postponements. Um, and uh, really for us to be able to save uh, any weddings that are taking place in October and November, the sooner we have that roadmap, the easier it is for venues to commit to those dates and not have, um, you know, this, uh, this putting couples on ice or being in that limbo period, because we do have the lockdown ending at the end of September. So we really do need to understand as an industry what is happening in October, what is happening in November, and any kind of um, information around that would be very, very useful. Along with that, um, we, we were on a bit of a roller coaster last year in regards to the wedding industry. We did find that other industries um, were opening up and there were, um, you know, some inconsistencies. So we do hope that um, for the wedding and the private event market, that as, as soon as things start to open up and that roadmap is available, it does talk specifically to the wedding market. So I do thank you, Minister, for acknowledging um, the fact that uh, there are some idiosyncrasies attached to our industry, but also that they are very much being acknowledged and recognised. And that's thanks to the efforts of um, the Restaurant Catering Association and everyone coming together last year and talking through this. So as soon as we have that roadmap, the wedding industry is ready to rock and roll. Um, you know, couples want to get married. People are really confident to be able to move forward. We just need to know, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and uh, I really, really just uh, can't stress enough the importance of us having that um, to be able to plan towards that 70% and 80% mark and then moving forward. So thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Minister. And thank you so much, uh, Wendy from Wedded Wonderland. And thank you, Tom. Uh, what um, the Premier and uh, every conversation that restaurant and catering has had with the New South Wales government is that uh, the freedoms will be available to those who are double jabbed uh, once the state reaches 70%. That is the overwhelming message. Uh, it is not changed. It is the message that the Premier gives every single day. Uh, I know I've seen dozens and dozens of uh, queries in the chat uh, in relation to that. Uh, it, it is the compass that uh, the Premier uh, is pointing and guiding the state by. Uh, certainly there are lots of, um, of uh, questions and, and heated uh, discussions and opinions around that, uh, but it is the compass that uh, the New South Wales government uh, is aiming for. And so it is very important that uh, as the roadmap is released, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, giving us plenty of time until uh, mid-October when we do expect that the state will be at 70%, um, that uh, your planning and your decisions and your discussions uh, are around that uh, double vaccinated uh, events uh, between 70 and 80 percent. And most certainly there will be uh, medical exemptions. Uh, obviously, uh, those are, have been well and truly tested uh, in the current public health orders. Um, but certainly we do expect that we will remain uh, under a public health order environment uh, between that 70 and 80 percent, as the minister said, uh, while the New South Wales government uh, tests out uh, and learns from uh, reopening to the fully vaccinated uh, cohort. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for all of your questions. And uh, once again, if you're here and you're not a member of Restaurant and Catering, uh, you can visit our website at rca.asn.au uh, or go to 1300 722 878. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And uh, certainly uh, we appreciate your questions. Uh, and. Uh, feel free to email any further questions on uh, through the contact on our website. So thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Wes. Thank you to Wes and Tom for your uh, professionalism and uh, dedication to this industry. It's been great to work with you through the challenging times and whether you're a member or not a member, I think uh, everyone on this call should recognise that, that these guys have been 
are pretty forthright um, in their uh, in their vo vocalising their views of the of the sector, uh, but they've been incredibly professional along the way as well. Thank you, and thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Nice.